Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to introduce you to the most popular and in my opinion the best library to do background tasks and task scheduling and repeating tasks in C Sharp and that is Hangfire and it's actually a library I've used myself in production at scale for a financial company so it is something that I know I can trust and I know it won't lose any of those repeating tasks and so on it is very very reliable you should know right out of the bat that yeah it is an open source library but it does have a commercial offering for companies and in my opinion that's very good because it means the developer is getting compensated for their work and it means they are actively working on this library and it's not gonna go out of business or disappear anytime soon. It's something I can trust and that's why I'm making this video. If you like a lot of content and you wanna see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on domtrain.com. Now, before I move on, I'd like to let you know we just launched a brand new course on Domtrain called Deep Dive in Domain-Driven Design. And that course is a follow-up to the existing Getting Started with Domain-Driven Design by Amikai Mantenband. In this second course, Amikai goes beyond what he built in the first course and we build a more entire and complete system using DDD. DDD is one of the most popular ways to build software, especially in .NET, and it is a must for anyone who wants to learn how to use DDD. Now to celebrate the loss, the first 200 of you can use discount code DDD20 to get 20% off on the deep dive course, these do go fast, so do not miss this opportunity to invest in your future. Now back to the video. Okay, so let's see what I have here. I have a simple ASP.NET Core API and it is completely empty. It doesn't really have anything. And the reason why I chose to do that is because it is very likely you want to run Hangfire in some ASP.NET Core environment. Even if you don't use many API endpoints or anything, uh, because Hangfire actually exposes a very nice dashboard and because you might have health check endpoints, metrics endpoints, and so on, and you're going to end up exposing something in HTTP anyway, running it this way makes it very, very easy to get started with Hangfire and integrate many endpoints. And that's because if I go to NuGet and I send for Hangfire, yes, I can find this main Hangfire library, but I also find this ASP.NET Core version of Hangfire, which behind the scenes will do all the configuration for me, and all I have to work with is some very nice pre-registered interfaces. So I'm going to go ahead and add this library. So now that I have it, I'm going to quickly add an endpoint and I'm going to say map get and I'm going to say job. Just something very, very small so I can trigger a, a job. And I'm going to say return results. OK. And I'm just going to say hello job here. And now I'm going to start with the most basic feature of Hangfire, which is probably not the one you're going to use, but it's a nice introduction into Hangfire. And that is just queuing something that needs to happen in the background. So if I put a method call here, this method called won't need to be awaited synchronously or asynchronously. It will just be in the background and my application will keep going and just return OK, no matter how long this thing takes behind the scenes to complete. So what I'm going to say to register Hangfire is builder.services.add Hangfire and I'm going to have some configuration here. And the two basic ones that you're going to see in every example is use simple assembly type serializer. We're going to explain what that is in a second and also use serializer recommended settings, which, you know, interestingly enough, we see serializer a couple of times. You're going to see why this is important now. If I just went ahead and I injected the interface that I need to use, which is the I background job client, and there's a background job client v2, by the way, because Hangfire is moving into a v2 model. But for now, we're going to talk about uh, the built in one. So I'm going to say job client here. Uh, all I need to do is say job client dot nq, and this will add something to happen in the background. And I'm going to say console dot right line and then hello from BG. And that is it. Now, if I just go ahead and run this as it is, what you're going to see is the application will start. However, the moment I say, hey, send this request in, I'm going to get a 500 error, an exception. And the exception I'm getting is that the job storage instance has not been initialized yet. What does that mean? Well, you see, what makes Hangfire so amazing is that it is actually storing all those jobs and tasks and recurring tasks in its data store. What data store? Well, you get to choose that. The default one, the most popular one, is actually SQL Server. So we have a persistent storage, but there's other packages like Postgres, SQLite, MySQL, 
and so on. I think I've seen MongoDB, there's Redis as well. So you have many, many options. Currently, we have the in-memory version in preview. So in-memory actually came later. And I'm going to just add it to introduce you to what Hank Fire can do. And we're going to move into SQL Server later in the video. Okay, so we have this now and we installed the in-memory package. And all we need to do to add it is say use in memory storage and we're also going to add the hang fire server the thing that will do the polling from the data store to actually execute those tasks so yes it's one thing to queue them it's another thing to process them which kind of also means you can decouple the processing from the queuing as well which is a very common pattern so i'm gonna say add hang fire server so we're gonna have both hang fire and the server in a single instance and what i want to add is an extra parameter here called schedule polling interval because Hankvar will poll the data store to see which tasks it needs to run. And by default, I think that number is 15 seconds. For the sake of this video, I'm going to reduce it to one second. Do not do this in production. You don't want to be spamming your data store every second to check which tasks are available. But no, there can be some drift depending on this value. So I'm going to say time span dot from seconds one. And then once I do that, I can say run this application. Then I can go back to Insomnia. You can see that the moment I run this, we have some more things here related to the server. And then I can say send this and you're going to see hello from BG. This happened in the background and it is not something that happened synchronously. It happened in the background. Now, something I haven't showed you yet is a very nice feature of Hangfire, which is I can say app.use Hangfire dashboard over here and maybe just move it at the top as well. And what this allows me to do is actually visualize my tasks. So the application is running and now I can go to my browser and say localhost 5000 forward slash hangfire. And I'm getting a dashboard like this where I have the hangfire dashboard. I have jobs, I have retries, recurring jobs and servers doing the processing. You can have many servers scaling out pointing to the same data store. Of course, not with in-memory storage because, well, each server has its own memory storage, but when we use a database, eventually we can do that. So here we can see the jobs. We have no jobs and we have none in queued. But if I go into my application over here uh, and I say in Insomnia, run this and I go back to the UI, then what you're going to see in the graph, and I think my face is actually hiding it, is that I just had one successful execution of a service. And if I go to jobs, you will see that one succeeded and it was a console.write line job. Very interesting how the application knows what it was. And if I click on it, you can see exactly the code that was run to make that invocation possible. But what exactly is happening here? How does Hangfire know how to run this? Maybe in an in-memory context, it makes sense. But what is this serialization thing? Well, I'll show you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the terminal and I'm going to run MS SQL, a persistent database. As you can see, it is running now in Docker. It is this one over here. And what I can do is I can go here on Rider, I can connect to a database, and I'm going to connect to MS SQL. So I'm just going to paste the connection string. And again, if you want to get access to any of this code, you can do it in the description down below. So I'm going to say test connection It's going to fail because it won't find that database created. So what I'll do instead is I'm going to say uh, just connect to the top level for now, test connection, it should all work fine. Here we go, connect, and we're going to create that Hangfire database. You can use an existing database as well, or you can have a dedicated database that's completely up to you. So I'm going to say Hangfire over here and create, and that will create my Hangfire database. Here we go. So now what I can do is I can go and remove that in-memory storage package, and I'm going to add the SQL server. Here we go. And the only thing I need to change in my existing code is this and say use SQL server storage. And then of course, the connection string, which is going to be this. And once I do that, and I have my database created, Hangfire automatically will go and create all the tables needed for SQL server. Now we do have a bit of an exception. And that is because you actually explicitly have to add the SQL server client. So we're going to use the SQL client, I'm going to close that. And I'm going to add this. The reason why this decision was made was because you might have compatibility issues with a new client because of the version you might be using of SQL Server. Uh, so to make it more flexible, you can either add the Microsoft Data SQL client, which is the one I recommend, or if you're in an old version, the system.data.client. 
So let's go ahead and add the Microsoft one. Here we go. Install that. And once we do that and I say run, what you're going to see is we're going to get all the tables created and the application is starting. In fact, let me just make that smaller and show you. We don't need all the schemas. Actually, we're going to refresh here. I'm going to say hang fire. Here you go. And now we have all the tables. Here we go. So what I'm going to do again is go ahead and call this send job. And I called it and I want to show you something. Well, two things actually. First, anything here now is persistent and you're going to see more connections. You're going to see the servers in a persistent way as they come up and down. You can see where this is connected. Uh, you can see every tries, jobs, whatever in a persistent manner. Uh, but if I go here and I say just run this job, then you can see again the application has now the two tasks succeeded over here. And I actually call this a few times as you're going to see over here now in the background, you're going to see a real time graph of everything being queued and completed as that one second polling period is coming in. And you can see another real time graph over here of everything being added and deleted. And if I go into the jobs and I see succeeded jobs, you're going to see all the jobs over here. Now, what's very interesting about this is the database, because if I go back and I show you what's in this job table, you're going to be like, what? Because you might wonder, how does Hangfire know how to run that code without storing the code? Well, it's not storing the code, but it is storing some instructions, as you can see over here, to know how to run the code. So for example, what is the type of the class containing the method I need to run? It is system.console. What is the method? It is write line. What is the parameter type? It is string. And then it stores the arguments over here in an array. So all that is stored in the database and you can see what succeeded, what failed. You have full history control and you can see more parameters over here related to the job. You can see the queue if you want to. There's many, many things. You can see all the new servers, how many workers they have. You can see counters. You can see all that stored here. So it's pretty clever on how it does things. It does, however, mean that if a namespace change, this is something that's stored, it could potentially not be found by Hangfire to be re-executed. So be very careful when you store a job in Hangfire and then you rename something because it needs to be able to serialize it. That's what these methods are doing and then deserialize it to execute it. Now, simply adding something into a background queue and having it work is one thing, but what about scheduling? What about, let's say, run something in five minutes? Well, in this case, it will be five seconds because I don't have all day. Well, you can very easily do that again with a job client. I'm going to say job client, and we're going to do the exact same thing. Pass down a parameter. The only difference is we also need a time span. I'm going to say from seconds, and I'm going to say five. So we have that one second polling period and then the five seconds. So this will run in five seconds after its execution. If I just hot reload, as you can see, I'm going to go back here, say send, and then one, two, three, four, five. I shouldn't have used the same text because you maybe missed that this was executed, but it was in fact executed. Let me quickly hot reload again and redo it so you can see it. Send one, two, three, four, five. Bam. So as you can see, now I also have scheduling and my application is still returning in real time without actually waiting for this to complete, which is awesome. And what's also awesome is the ability to schedule recurring tasks. So something to happen every n amount of time. So what you can say is you can inject the I recurring job manager. And this also has a V2, by the way. And once I inject the job manager, I can say job manager dot add or update so it can re-add the job if it's not added already or updated uh, and you can say hang fire demo maybe or actually let's say every five seconds and then you can have your lambda which by the way doesn't have to be a lambda you can make a type and pass the entire type in here i'm going to show you that in a second and then pass your lambda in here say console right line hello from bg at three. And what you can do here is you can add a cron expression, which can be passed and translated into every five minutes, for example. So you can do that by passing down this expression. And once I do that, I'm going to say run this, go to insomnia, put it into hang fire, and then it just stays there and it's persistent. So I don't need to keep doing that. If I click it again, it's going to just update it. And if I go back to the dashboard, as you can see, I have a recurring job now over here and I can see it's cron expression. I can see what type of job it is and I can actually manually trigger it if I want to. So one, two, three, 
and I can go back here and I can see it manually being triggered by the dashboard. Pretty, pretty cool. And you can do that, you know, every Monday, every whatever. It is completely up to you. It is very, very flexible. Now, what happens if you want to encapsulate all that behavior into a class and actually have dependency injection as well? Well, that's very, very easy, actually. I'm going to say over here, example job, I'm just going to make a class. And then all I'm going to do is have a method called do something. And I'm injecting the iLogger to say, hey, I did something and that's it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say schedule the example job class over here and then take that class over here and say x dot do something. So you pass the class here and then you use a classes method here. And then you can say, what's the time span uh, in five seconds? Of course, I have to register that service because it's going to be activated in dependency injection. So builder.services.add singleton or add transient if you want it to be instantiated every single time, you can do that as well. And once I do that, I'm going to say, go ahead and run this app is running. I'm going to go back to insomnia, call that. And as you're going to see in five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, bam, I did something and was activated using dependency injection. Overall, really, really nice library, really, really flexible. You can go way, way more in depth with it. And if you want a more in-depth video in more advanced cases where we can actually scale the application out, please let me know in the comments down below and I'm happy to make that video. But now I want to know from you, what's your favorite scheduling library? Do you prefer Hangfire, Quartz, maybe something else? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching and as always, keep coding.